Morning, Steve. Morning, Andy.
Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this launch of uh, a Rusi paper on the role of the Royal Navy in the Indo-Pacific tilt. I'm Siddharth Koshal. I'm the research fellow for sea power at the military sciences team at Rusi, and it's my great pleasure to be joined by my co-authors, Professor John Laub and Andy Young, as well as our discussant, Dr. Kevin Rowlands, who heads up the Royal Navy Strategic Studies Center. So uh, the way we'll run this discussion is essentially a sort of 10-minute introduction by, uh, each by myself, John, and Andrew about uh, you know various facets of the paper, uh, followed by uh, comments by uh, Kevin, Kevin uh, regarding you know, the Royal Navy's perspective on uh, the Indo-Pacific tilt, and then we'll open it up to you, the audience, for a Q&A session, all of which uh, will be on the record. Uh, so if uh, you have any questions, I'd encourage you to use the Q&A function, which is in the bottom uh, center off your screens. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll kick us off with a broad discussion of what the the sort of impetus that drove the this paper and, and what its sort of function is. So it's not a policy paper per se. I mean, it informs policy, but it was essentially uh, commissioned by the Royal Navy Strategic Studies Center with RUSI to provide a sort of uh, a counterpoint against which policy could be measured and which various facets of the Royal Navy's role in the Indo-Pacific tilt could be debated. And so when me and my co-authors kind of uh, started uh, approaching the question of what this paper should do, what its key sort of thrust should be, I think there were two main threads that really struck us. The first was solving the paradox of delivering strategic effect in a region where, at least for the immediate future, if not necessarily in the medium term, there will be lim a limited Royal Navy presence, limited mass. And the second was the intersections between a naval presence and the wider sort of imperatives that drive the Indo-Pacific tilt, in particular, the uh, idea of uh, UK prosperity. And really the military thread that we felt bound all of this together was this idea of assured sovereignty, the notion that actually trends in the military domain are, and in specifically in the, in the maritime domain are increasingly enabling smaller powers to uh, inflict uh, and impose a, a cost on larger adversaries at sea, uh, you know, witness Ukraine's, uh, so the way in which uh, Ukraine has inflicted costs on the Russian Black Sea, <clears throat> on the Russian Black Sea fleet with a homegrown anti-access capability. But that these trends, while in some ways empowering smaller actors, also create niche roles for partners uh, to engage in knowledge transfer, but also to perhaps pursue some of their own broader geostrategic and geoeconomic objectives. So as if, if as a capstone, we assume that for Britain as a commercial and maritime power, there are two broad uh, sort of strategic goals in the Indo-Pacific. On the one hand, engagement with the wider region, and on the other hand, a competitive relationship with the People's Republic of China that has nonetheless not been defined explicitly as a threat, and not necessarily defined as an adversary in the vein of a Russia. Uh, partner enablement, uh, in a, a sort of reinforcing, to paraphrase George Cannon, natural forces of resistance and balancing in the region seemed like the logical sort of capstone concept uh, to, uh, that sits over or should sit over everything that the Royal Navy does in the region. And below that, what makes it perhaps most viable today for that sort of engagement to proceed is a series of trends in the maritime domain uh, they, that, you know, sometimes are broadly grouped under the rubric of anti-access area denial. Now, there's a tendency to see that uh, if, uh, if for Blue Water navies to see A2AD primarily through the lens of a threat and a challenge. It's something to be overcome when a nation such as Russia or the People's Republic of China erects an A2AD bubble around its own claimed sphere of influence. Uh, but it also represents in some ways a strong barrier against revisionism. It also represents an avenue for partner engagement. And a variety of factors may make it more and more viable for smaller actors to enable, uh, to engage in anti-access approaches to not necessarily defeat large navies, a sufficiently motivated large navy will, all, will typically achieve its goals, but certainly to raise the costs of revisionism uh, in, in, in and around their own territory. Uh, a few of those uh, trends are the decreasing costs of effectors, you know, 
think of something like missile, think of things like cruise missiles. Uh, they have, of course, been uh, around for a while. The anti-ship cruise missile threat is not necessarily a novel one, uh, but you see capabilities that were once the preserve of major powers, things like the P-800 Onyx uh, in the hands of small states, Vietnam, or even non-state actors like Hezbollah. A number of trends in areas like uh, manufacturing, consider, for, uh, in particular additive manufacturing, may decrease the production costs of things like cruise missiles even further, essentially making what would be, once have been the preserve of larger states increasingly available to smaller partners. But it goes somewhat beyond uh, uh, sort of specific effectors in, for example, uh, and, and the aerial threat to maritime vessels. In, in the recent uh, attack on uh, on Sevastopol, we saw, you know, the, the weaponization of uh, unmanned surface vehicles to good effect against larger vessels. Uh, the IRGC Navy is in a similar vein seeking to weaponize unmanned underwater vehicles as uh, so effectively sort of smart torpedoes and improvements in areas like uh, computing uh, uh, and, and computing uh, the smaller sizes of processors as well as the sophistication of sensors that can increasingly be packed on smaller and smaller uh, capabilities mean that you increasingly see a very diverse set of effectors that can challenge the freedom of action of surface vessels at sea. It's not that any one effector is necessarily a silver bullet against maritime power. You know, UUVs are probably limited to, uh, at least as they're fielded, uh, and USVs uh, of the kind used against Sevastopol to targeting stationary targets in harbor and defenses against them could have been erected by the Black Sea Fleet. Navies have dealt with anti-ship cruise missiles for some Time. It's more the gestalt threat that all of these capabilities produce in tandem and the requirements they impose in terms of force protection, in terms of the risk of losing disproportionate at, uh, at losses on a superior force that can provide a deterrent effect. In other words, harassing may well be good enough for a smaller actor. But although you know, in some ways, we're seeing the ball move towards the millions, towards the sort of the actors who previously might have been disadvantaged in power, particularly in terms of the reducing costs of effectors. Uh, there are still certain things which remain uh, the preserve of more sophisticated states, more sophisticated economies, uh, and, and which create opportunities for knowledge transfer. So amongst them, you might consider that while the production costs of effectors may actually drop over the years, project costs probably won't. To use an example, uh, the algorithm of, uh, on uh, an effector like Spear 3 or even El Razm may theoretically be affordable to a number of states where the countries that produce them willing to sell. Uh, but the algorithms aboard these capabilities, the sensors on them, these are ten generally the results of projects that tend to uh, sort of extend over a period of time. And that may well be reinforced if we, one looks at trends in you know, additive manufacturing, uh, the factor that may decrease the costs of a number of effectors the productive capabilities underpinning additive manufacturing may still well may are likely to remain concentrated in uh, relatively developed uh, economies uh, the second area where you know there is a perhaps a uh, room for partnering is uh, actually combining multiple sensors and effectors into something that's more than the sum of their parts in the context of a deny in, in, a, in the context of an information denied environment uh, when you consider that most maritime uh, combat will be conducted in a complex electromagnetic environment, often in areas where civilian and international vessels are uh, present. And when you consider the uh, the consequences of misclassifying targets in the past, things like the USS Stark incident, for example, during the Iran-Iraq tanker war, uh, the ability to actually maintain a system of communication, of command and control, adequate staffing, and the ability to classify targets in a con under conditions of information denial uh, is something that 
actually everyone is struggling through, and which by extension creates opportunities for co-development. For example, you know, if you uh, in a Royal Navy context, if you think of things like the Huge Commander Force Program, or for that matter, the Royal Navy's work on coordinating autonomous platforms, uh, many of the challenges of operating capabilities under information denied environments are uh, things the Royal Navy itself is work is working on, and which it theoretically could work on in tandem with Indo-Pacific partners. This creates a trade-off. On the one hand, one is extending access to a degree of sensitive capability, but on the other hand, one is thickening degrees of engagement with key partners, and perhaps most importantly, uh, sort of buttressing areas where revisionism is most likely. But after all, revisionism very rarely occurs against major powers directly. It tends to occur against you know second and third states, often unaligned ones who <clears throat> take Ukraine, or at least unallied, not ones without explicit allied commitments. You know, take Ukraine for example. Uh, the Third areas, uh, the third and fourth areas we looked at are the questions of sustaining a force in the field, but also of actively maneuvering in a contested littoral space, uh, much of which will be highly relevant to areas like the South China Sea. And so our sort of capstone argument was that if partnership, in, if partner engagement is the broad sort of ask of the Royal Navy in the Indo-Pacific in the immediate term, the idea of assured sovereignty and effectively abetting the creation of zones of denial might be a way in which engagement-oriented groupings, things like LRG South, for example, could essentially link the objectives of, on the one hand, the national security uh, objectives of the UK as spelled out in the IR, with those of small and medium powers within the region, as well as link them more explicitly, as uh, John will discuss, with the objectives of some of the more the broader sort of Team UK uh, imperatives spelled out in uh, in documents like uh, the DSIS. Uh, so with that, I will sort of stop with the initial pitch and turn over to Andy and John to run over specifics in uh, in short order before we turn over to Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Um, so coming, coming at this question, the, the real question for us was how can the RN generate suffic uh, sufficient um, uh, power absence of mass? Um, bearing in mind that the main function of the Royal Navy will be in the high north, it will be in the Atlantic, it will be in, in the European theatre. Um, it's the, the carrier and the F-35 are embedded with NATO, within NATO. Um, and actually, one of the one of the things that is little understood about the Indo-Pacific tilt is it is just a tilt. It's it's not a full commitment. And actually, the, Britain's security, its immediate security, is intimately linked linked with Europe. And, and this is one of the things that, that really comes out in the paper. Um, so the question, therefore, was what capability does the RN have that it can generate enough quantity and quality, and it's that quality element um, that, that it can really uh, utilise to, to, to meaningfully enhance regional partners? Um, bearing in mind, as Sid has mentioned, that the Royal Navy footprint east of Suez is actually going to be, is going to continue to be very light. There's two batch two OPVs, um, HMS uh, Spay and Tamar, uh, which are out in the Pacific at the moment, and those very much on engagement and fishery protection and, and almost assuring, well, I say almost, but assuring UK sovereignty of places like the Pitcairn Islands and the maritime protected uh, zones around there. Um, so they've got those. And then you've got the, the LRG South, which is going to pulse out of um, Duckham, the Joint Support uh, Logistics Base um, in Oman. That will pulse out. So these are actually very, uh, very light footprints that we've got. And when you look at the embarked commando force that will be on the LRG South, you're looking at very few numbers in terms of uh, uh, from, from the brigade, from three commando brigades, it still is. Um, but it's what those numbers actually mean and what they can develop, because the OPVs have a capability in themselves, the LRG has a capability in themselves. And something we shouldn't forget when we're talking about this is that Opkipian is still ongoing. Um, and if you want to see uh, Royal Navy real expertise in the area, you just have to look at uh, this, this, this um, uh, operation that's been running for two decades now, which has been assuring our access and trade access through 
contested a contested littoral region, which is the Straits of Paul Muz. Um, and that's uh, four maritime, uh, or sorry, uh, mine countermeasure vessels, plus a landing ship dock as the, uh, as the mothership. And we've, we've now pulsed a, or, or are stationing a uh, frigate or uh, escort out there as well. So that's really the context. Bearing in mind that yes, the, the carrier LRG North and the majority of the escort fleet is going to remain um, remain uh, west of Suez and, and in home waters. Um, so when we go through this, it's then a case of what do the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines and the wider commando force have to offer in limited packages um, for short bursts. Um, as in when you look at their operational readiness matrix matrix and they hand that on to the next on onto the next team to those regional partners. Um, now first off I'm going to show my true colors here. Um, I'm a former training manager and there is something which we allude to which is a unique naval capability but it's not one that the Navy necessarily understands it has itself um, and that is its training managers. Um, because these individuals, they act as training consultants. It's, uh, it's a very um, uh, uh, business oriented way of doing things in some respects. But you go out and you have that. You do everything from scoping what the original ask is to training needs analysis. So scoping what training you need to, to, to deliver on that ask. And then everything from the training design implementation and the assurance and evaluation of that training. Now, uh, Jack Watling and uh, Nick Reynolds talked about having this, this tail when you're looking at host nation partnering um, in war by others means. Um, this is what the training management branch and the training capability managers can actually deliver and actually provide for uh, uh, host nations so that they actually understand what, they, what technology they need, how they are going to train and support that and create that system of systems um, and understand how all these things plug in together um, and really develop the human capability that is required behind that. Um, when we then look into the wider piece that the Royal Navy can provide, you've got things like um, FOSP, which is uh, uh, Fleet Operational Sea Training that routinely has, I think it, uh, last count I had was about 22 different nations attending FOSP uh, serials in the UK every year. So that's every Thursday, they pulse out and go to war. Um, uh, in, in, in Plymouth approaches, in Western approaches. And then you've got th things like Perisher. Um, and these, these training evolutions and training, uh, training organisations do have a lasting effect. And you, you see that with um, the fact that the Australians have now got their own Perisher course up and running, which they've leaned heavily on from the, from the Royal Navy and from their European counterparts when it comes to SSKs. Um, uh, and then you look at how the Americans embed on Perisher as well, and how American ships come come to uh, come to the Royal Navy and NATO ships, other NATO nations come to the Royal Navy for that operational uh, assurance training prior to deployment. Um, so it's world leading in that in delivering that training. And how can you take that out? Well, actually, again, here the Royal Navy does have a history of this. Uh, between 2003 and 2011, you had uh, uh, Royal Navy um, uh, military advisory and support teams uh, or training teams um, out in Iraq, out in Yemen, um, and a few other, other places who are all doing all of this from, from small ship up to big ship. Now, where they also um, are very useful is taking back some of those some of those lessons identified lessons learned and feeding them into the Royal Navy. So you get this real synthesis um, going in, the, in this virtual cycle. The key element that the um, that the Royal Marines will bring to this and three commando force are in their uh, regional sort teams, so their support assist liaise train, um, which are very akin to the Army's S Triple short term training teams, um, but. Backing them up, you have that LRG South Pulse with um, a, a with a um, uh, commando uh, strike company uh, embarked, and that commando strike company can break down into further teams of, uh, of NLATs who can go ashore, and they can deliver something which the Army can't in in their strategies, which is that holistic approach to um, tactical um, and operational uh, uh, problems that that host nations might be. Uh, facing 
Why? Because Royal Marines um, have got a broader range of um, specializations, SQs underpinning them, and then they've got all of their embedded artillery, so their combat support, their combat service support uh, alongside them. And that makes a big difference as well. So when we're talking about the, the SALTs and the uh, MLATs, um, these individuals, when you link that into the fact that they've also got embedded schoolies, training managers, um, you're creating a comprehensive systems approach to the kind of uh, problems that, that these nations might be facing. So it's about understanding the, the, the initial problem, it's about uh, understanding the training that is required and understanding how all of that technology will come together to, um, to really solve what they are seeing. Um, now this can happen across a broad range of things and where here you've got the other element to the Royal Navy offer, which is the Royal Navy is experimenting all the time. You've got future commando force, which is constantly experimenting with um, new technologies and uh, how you integrate those. You've got Navy X, um, which is experimenting with the surface and subsurface warfare capabilities. How do you do that remotely? How do you do that in contested littorals? How do you gain that picture? And then you've got um, the Royal Navy 700X squadron. Um, which are looking at the unmanned aerial picture and how those and how those systems can then link in. So you've got all of these moving parts. You have individuals out on the ground seeing what the question is and the ask is in regions that we are interested in. You've got the Royal Navy experimenting with new equipments back home. And then you've got these, these individuals in the middle who are linking it all together and bringing together that package so that the Royal Navy does have, which, which historically does have, have um, uh, form in training and developing um, other nations' navies and their coast guards, um, and creating that virtuous cycle of experiential learning, um, which will underpin not just the navy's development, but the development of those, those nations who are partnering, partnering with out there. Um, all of that comes through. There's a huge, huge amount more, but I'll, um, I'll hand over to John at this point um, to, to talk about the economic side of this. No, cheers, Andy. And, you know, like Andy said, there's this huge soft side to this in terms of imparting those sort of soft capabilities to partner navies, but there's also a shift, you know, in the sort of the hard side, the material side from the sort of the few and exquisite to the cheap and the many. And as we think of how to retool our own industrial capabilities, our defense industrial capabilities, there may be a point of convergence between the sort of foreign policy objective and the broader economic piece. And that's really John's expertise, so I'll hand to him. Sid, thank you. And I, I should start perhaps by thanking both Andy and Sid for allowing me to contribute to this paper. I found it a very stimulating and thought-provoking set of arguments as they matured. And the one thing that occurred to me throughout the process was that there's so much more to explore in this space. And I think kind of where, where I come from is it, both in my own uh, literature and what I've contributed to over the years, it's very much a strong sense that uh, the execution of defence and the projection of power is very much a complex public-private system. And I think quite often we can find ourselves down the cul-de-sac of just thinking about operator partnering and everything else is enabling. And I think that, that does a disservice perhaps in not really properly understanding and accepting just how complex that public-private enterprise is, particularly when we're playing across borders, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, what I wanted to do in my contribution was to try and explore some of those tensions and some of those uh, sort of hard enablers, if you would allow. Uh, the one thing that strikes me, of course, you know, right at the start is that the tilt has to be seen in the context of AUKUS, and AUKUS has to be seen in the context of, of the tilt. And I'm just very conscious that, you know, we've got chums from DARPA and DSTL and a couple of sort of Australian agencies meeting in Perth now as we speak. And, you know, they're bringing in uh, both a mix of global primes and very bespoke and interesting SMEs uh, to think through to be clear, a technology map that could uh, help to generate the future artifacts of AUKUS, whatever we happen to think that is, and we can have that debate another day, perhaps. I think that's quite significant to my mind, because what we see with that is an element of selection 
you know, there, there are companies that have committed to that broader US, UK, Australia space, uh, defense technology space, capability generation space, whatever language, tax, taxonomy we're comfortable with. You know, some folk have committed, some folk have taken uh, decisions at board level, at investor level to play that game, if you would allow. And that's going to populate, to my mind, what we think is the art of the possible over the next few years, whether it's under the label of Tilt, under the label of AUKUS, or indeed under the label of uh, UK prosperity, which we can touch on sort of a little bit later. Uh, I think with that, it would be right to say, picking up from Sid's point, that you know, A to AD as a literature is very much part of A, what we've tapped into, and B, what is exercising uh, certainly the three governments at the moment in the context of the South China Sea and broader Asia Pacific area. I think what we'll see this week from some of the discussions that are in government and private sector technologists are, are having a strong focus on subsea sensors, stealth in all of its guises, uh, unmanned autonomy, wherever we are on that uh, continuum, and of course, integration. And everybody talks about and throws in integration as a really sort of critical key component without really defining or maybe even understanding what it is and what it represents. And one of the things that I write about continually, I suspect, is not that there's ever been a steady state, but when we have slower technology development times, integration can be a wicked problem that's solvable. When technology is so speedy and, dare I say, so dispersed and hard to protect, what we're actually integrating is flowing blancmange and the, the different behaviors programmatically that are necessary for that level of integration where it becomes actually usable for the operator and the end user is something that I think we'll be exploring more and more over the years ahead. Uh, picking up on, on some of those sort of key areas, particularly all of the enablers for sort of stealthy subsea operations that we'll see with the future commander force narrative. A lot of that at the moment in the early TRLs is held by the private sector. I sit on the board of one of those companies. You know, I know that it is extremely difficult to keep investors on board at TRL one to three, one to four. And the UK government very wisely, to my mind, is now taking very small uh, packets of investment flowing from uh, various budgets into the STL. Uh, and those 200K, 300K small investments, if you like taking a punt investment, a gambler's investment, are really smart. And we haven't seen those really in the UK story to date as such, but I think they've become more and more important as we migrate through you know, future TRL certainly to TRL five and six if, if we're comfortable with that language. Uh, what that means, of course, is we very much open up a debate around ownership. And you know, I know both main political parties at the moment are very nervous of having a shareholder stake in some of those uh, SMEs. I think that is a huge mistake, and I think the discussions that we're going to be having certainly over the next two years about defence contributing to prosperity in a period of recession is going to have to include uh, those stake discussions and ownership discussions. And we need to be very clear eyed about this, because, you know, if we're thinking about offering capability to small island nations, which is, you know, the part of the thrust of the paper, then how we consider the licensing regime, how we consider exports, are we going to start right at the beginning with everything that's generated for this region will be under open general export arrangements so we don't have to go back and run through the bureaucracy again and again. All of that is important, 
but very few people are actually running that through uh, to its logical conclusion currently in government would be my gentle suggestion because that all takes time if we need to change legislation you know you've got at least a 12 month uh, timeline to run that through uh, parliament and that's assuming parliament functions well and that's not been the uk experience of the past three or four years perhaps so there are a lot of political governmental enablers uh, within our commitment to uh, this area and region of the world it seems to me to be much more than uh, end user to end user partnering i think if if it's limited to that we'll just play doctrine top trumps and i think that would be something that is completely suboptimal uh, if the narrative doesn't provide a home for these emerging technologies then what on earth have we all been about for the past few years uh, so i think that that's exciting and that brings me up brings me on to something we alluded to in the paper but but didn't really sort of drive to ground was you know is this decade going to be the decade of uh, training transformation because because if it is then there's a real opportunity here for uh, extending influence and commitment to small nations through that lever and you know, my, my, my simple case would be you know we know that uh, uk land uh, capability so being refreshed this year next year uh, collector training transformation program you know, 900 million to 1.6 billion initially you know pick, pick your preferences an uh, ioc by 25 which is lunacy but at least it's a you know it's a target that people can start to work to until we need to push back a little bit there is no way that that saves as a single domain imperative that makes no sense at all and i'm not a training specialist but you know, the folk you are would know that training integration is one of the big challenges we'll have over the next 10 years or so clearly there's a role here and you know that uh that migration from training to comfortable deployable doctrine with our small nation partners at the apex of that certainly seems logical and sensible and a, a really grown-up role for the Royal Navy and British policymakers to to play and and lastly if that's not too tortuous and that seems fairly reasonable there is a clear commercial benefit here because if these enabling technologies are being developed onshore here and exported through current uh, export regulations from the UK then there is a uh, exchequer benefit for that clearly there is a uh, industrial mass benefit for that clearly and at a moment where we're struggling perhaps to really ensure that we have the skills and competencies that we need for all of the maritime programs that are in play at the moment adding another through clear-eyed uh, acquisition commitments to the region uh, through these enabling technologies will contribute towards that, that skills mass and i think that will be incredibly important for the uk uh, lastly there is a political dimension to this and you don't need me to tell anybody that both main parties at the moment are putting together big thoughts on defense for the next year or two those have to be thematic if, if they're just generic political statements at this moment that's a huge mistake so the influence on the two main party defense teams around thinking through these wicked problems through a programmatic lens is incredibly important and this is one that I suspect people can understand and, and really explore and perhaps exploit so I think that that's where this paper kind of becomes quite significant because it's not just thinking about uh, end user partnering important and significant though that is and it's not just thinking about uh, doctrine in the round it's not just thinking about you know how, how we set up our uh, defensive back line so uh, 
you know, we've got a bubble that they can't penetrate and, and our offensive chaps can go and penetrate their bubbles. It's all of that, but it's also about these key commercial industrial enablers and technology enablers that can be exploited through this thing. Right. Well, thanks very much, John. So that's our pitch in brief. <laughs> so I'll turn it over now to Dr. Rollins for the Royal Navy's uh, view as, and uh, then we'll open it up to you, the audience. Um, so John, Andy, thanks very much. I mean, I, I think the first thing I want to say about this paper is that it is, um, to us, it's incredibly timely. Um, there is a refresh going on, allegedly, of the integrated review, and no doubt following the next election, some point in the next couple of years, there will be a, a, a fully fledged defence security integrated review of, of, of some sort. So playing um, into that, not just in a sort of uh, in, a, in a selfish, self-centered sense, but into contributing ideas and, and fresh thinking is, I think, um, where, we're, where we want to be. And, and this paper is very timely um, because it's a it, it's a shifting landscape um, constantly. It's interesting that John mentioned it needs to, you know, the tilt needs to consider AUKUS. But of course, the tilt was was announced well before AUKUS was announced. And that's a new thing. And and strangely enough, there's a, a land war in Europe going on um, since AUKUS was announced. So, so, so it is a changing landscape. So, in the, against the backdrop of a refresh of the integrated review, uh, the need to to start playing into into future thematic thinking for for future defence reviews, this is a start of a conversation, not the end of a conversation about this. So, um, the Royal Navy as an enabling force the Royal Navy as um, a player in the attempts to counter Chinese um, adventurism, perhaps in, in the Indo-Pacific, the Royal Navy as a player in supporting His Majesty's government's objectives um, across all lines of uh, arms of government and lines of development uh, in the Indo-Pacific, um, and the Royal Navy as a player who wants to, that wants to build capability and capacity and influence for the UK without being condescending, I think is, uh, is important as well. Uh, and I note this in, 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 the, in the written questions so far, and I'd love to get onto those. What is incredibly important is, although I'm coming to this from a, quite a parochial perspective, being part of the Royal Navy Strategic Study Centre, this is a joint endeavour, this is a whole of defence, whole of government approach that we need to, we need to be cognizant of. I just want to say something quickly about the work that, that uh, my centre does, um, because we're here to inform decision makers not to make decisions, um, to bring in fresh thinking, to harness the intellectual capital of the people that we've got within the naval community. That's both the regulars, the reserves, the civil servants and, and, and industry to engage with academia and think tanks. Hence, we're, we're here. And all of that carries a caveat, which is Nothing in this paper and nothing I say is policy. <laughs> uh, we're here to be a necessary irritant to, to, um, to engage in the debate, uh, to inform decision makers and inform policy and strategy decisions for the future. So that's, I hope, what we're doing with this. I do hope that some of it becomes policy in time um, because there is some great thinking out there and there's some great thinking in, in this paper. So some of the work that we do um, uh, it, it, it is in, in this way. So the latest report that we've, we've delivered uh, and is on the maritime contribution to the Indo-Pacific tilt. Um, because it's interesting, John you know, queried, you know, do we know what we mean by integrated or integration? I, I would say largely, no, we don't, but it's a good thing to discuss and debate. And likewise, it's great having announcements from government periodically to say, we're going to do this, that, and the other including tilt to the Indo-Pacific. And then you get down to the, um, the, the level of an individual service within a department of state. And you say, well, what does it actually mean for the Royal Navy or the maritime domain? And, and I think we, you know, that's where we need to um, build the thinking in. Um, so the report that we've written um, of, uh, and this paper is, is part of that report, um, and has been has been submitted. It is on limited circulation, and it is internal think piece. Um, but I think it's worth describing some elements of, of it. 
um, because it's had multiple contributions. Um, we've had workshops, we've had conferences, including with, with, with Rusi, and some of the ideas that we've thrown around. So what, what is the tilt? In fact, what is the, what is the Indo-Pacific? Because I, I, I um, at, the, at, at the end of this report, I think different people have different ideas of what the Indo-Pacific uh, is. Different departments of state have different ideas of what the Indo-Pacific is. Some are very focused geographically. Um, some are very focused um, thematically, particularly on, on the prosperity agenda. Um, so what is a naval Indo-Pacific? Because I think it's pretty large um, because the, uh, the thing about navies is that they um, can't be everywhere at all times and the oceans are pretty large. So you've got to focus in certain areas and we have lines of communication, we have choke points and we have ingress and egress points and we have ports and infrastructure uh, and things that we can, we can focus on. Uh, we've asked, what are we doing already? And is, is it effective? Um, I don't want to talk at all about the Carry Strike Group 21 deployment because that's a, yeah. is it a one-off or is it, it will, will it come back in a, in a couple of years? But it's a, it, it's a totemic uh, deployment. But what we do have is persistent presence in other areas by other means. And that's worth um, investigating as well. So we did this report and I think um, it, it's not giving away any great secrets and um, you probably don't need to do a huge amount of research to come up with the same ideas um, yourselves. But we came up with three broad areas that we think we should focus on. One is increasing climate diplomacy with small, independent, developing states. There are a lot of them in, in the Indo-Pacific. And it's something we do, I think, uh, that level of engagement with, with small island states. Uh, something we do particularly well or have done uh, historically in, in the Caribbean and it's something we can uh, definitely translate and transfer to the Indo-Pacific and, and I think we are and there's more to do there. Um, there's then enhancing our littoral response presence. Um, Andy's mentioned LRG South. Um, I think there's a huge scope to use um, in, in interesting and innovative ways the littoral, littoral response group uh, in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific Ocean as well, um, and, and how we do that. Uh, and then, of, of course, the third thing, uh, and perhaps the most important uh, in terms of fresh thinking, is this idea of assured sovereignty that the paper uh, plays into. It, it, I think it's really key. It's a, I think it's a great idea. Turning A to AD on, on its head, not being condescending to partner nations, building prosperity and influence, and having bespoke bespoke solutions, not a one size fits all for countries that perhaps are hedging between uh, two major players. And I don't think we, we don't chart a completely neutral course through the middle of those two, um, two major players in, in the Indo-Pacific, but we do offer something different and, and something perhaps uh, a, a little uh, more palatable uh, to some of those uh, nations that we want to engage with and whether that's selling equipment or helping with training or building capacity or helping design command and control systems or or whatever each one will be different in different uh, areas different regions within the mega region uh, and, and different uh, uh, different states but we can we the Royal Navy we the U UK defense can play into in, into that space pretty effectively, I think. So the report on the exoskeleton force, uh, the, the paper, it, it's gone already to the, to the First Sea Lord and the Navy senior leadership. Um, it's doing the rounds at the moment. It will be factored into the refresh of the integrated review that's going on. And the ideas that, that are contained within it are informing future defense and security uh, reviews. Uh, and I, I believe, truly believe that. So. I think it has policy impact uh, and that is really important. So thanks to Sid, John, Andy and Rusi for, for taking part in this and delivering what is some great fresh thinking that is going to uh, make a huge difference. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, so with that, we'll uh, take uh, questions from the audience. 
So mindful of the fact that the first thing you said was you don't want to talk about CSG21 again, Kevin. I'm going to start with a question about CSG21 from Dr. Lee Willard, but I'll, I'll take my swing at it and then I'll uh, let it do the round. So um, the basic question from uh, Lee Willard is, you know, if it was sent back again, what, what would it do differently or what's the effect it delivers? Uh, and for me, it's a CSG deployment is a sort of a, it's a costly diplomatic signal, even if the carry itself doesn't remain in the region. The very fact it, that it is a massive enterprise is a diplomatic statement of intent. Uh, that creates, uh, you know, the diplomatic equivalent of, you know, a breach, as it were, a certain, uh, the sort of the impetus to do other things. But of course, without subsequent persistent engagement, uh, that can very easily peter out. So where I'd see CSG deployments, at least in the near term, fitting in is sort of reinforcing a message of diplomatic commitment, which in turn creates the space for things like engagement on climate security, like Kevin uh, discussed, persistent engagement on the subject of assured sovereignty. And in other words, it's it's almost a, a, a basis for starting those conversations which which sort of make up the substance of the Navy's engagement in the region. But uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to take a swing at that one. Nope. nope. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, the next question we had uh, was actually from uh, Hank Warner. Um, and it was uh, it was on the side. Well, it, it linked a bit to what uh, you said, Kevin, about you know, the, uh, the idea of partnerships in the economic dimension. And I suppose the question was how much factors like uh, the safety of pipelines, uh, fishing grounds, drill areas ought to be uh, factored into the Royal Navy's engagement in the region? Or do you see that as more of an acute challenge in Europe than it is in the Indo-Pacific? Um, I think it's a, I think it's a challenge. Everyone, the, the next report that, that um, the Strategic Studies Centre is working on now is um, it is loose. We'll refine the title, but it's loosely called economic warfare. Um, so, what do we mean by that? What do we mean by um, protection of critical national infrastructure, subsea cables, um, underwater infrastructure, and, and so on? Um, is that focused within within um, home waters and, and Europe initially, and then expanding further? Potentially, um, because uh, it's uh, it's not easy, it's tricky, it's ex expensive, and it takes um, a lot of resource um, to be involved in in, in that space. Um, so, where I think um, the UK can play in, in that into the Indo-Pacific is is probably building on the back of you know the, the recommendations in the, in this paper. It's about enabling others to do what they um, can do themselves better. Um, so we're not there to charge in and protect everyone's pipelines, um, but we may gain some useful um, uh, experience and skills within our home waters and within Northern Europe, which are going to help others then to, to learn from in, in, in the Indo-Pacific. So I think the next one's probably one I'd, I'd pitch to you, Andy. It's uh, from Rachel Blackman Rogers about, uh, if I were to summarize it, it's how does the Royal Navy uh, maintain its competitive edge as, as a partner in the area of training that, you know, nations would wish to engage in, in a sort of changing environment, particularly when, you know, different partners might have their own idiosyncratic regional uh, sort of requirements based on their, their particular regions. Yeah, I, I think there's there's two points here one is which that there are there are certain things which are enduring there are certain principles and lessons of war at sea which do um, assist no matter where you are um, and the royal navy has a uh, has a very rigorous and robust um, answer training answer to those um, and it's informed by practice um, the royal navy was the last navy to have that actually fought a war at sea and those lessons, the lessons from the Falklands are hardwired into everything the Royal Navy does. Nobody does damage control, et cetera, the way the Royal Navy does. Um, that's why people come to OST to, uh, to operational sea training. So those enduring principles remain. Um, the key elements in terms of its credibility comes from that training capability management um, uh, capacity that it has, because the Royal Navy has embedded um, the, these training consultants at every level of its organization when it comes to looking at its training, at how it um, brings in new technology, at how it uh, interacts with industry um, and so on and so forth. Um, and those individuals, they're constantly scoping. 
they're constantly looking at what the what the potential threat is, what it, what are the the things that are coming in, and how do we orientate to that? It is a constant evaluative process. Um, now, what that means is that you've got this this fantastic training organisation which is constantly learning about what it is going to face in the future according to these ab um, abiding and enduring principles, um, and that's really where it comes into its own. Um, the fact that you then tailor that approach to, to the people you're talking to in the room, um, and, and you see this, this happening uh, regularly anyway, you don't go out and give exactly the same training to the Iraqis that you give to the Yemenis or what have you. They, they have different purposes and different. And when we're looking at things like as well, that assuring national infrastructure and um, offshore patrolling and inshore patrolling and all of that sort of thing, well, the Royal Navy has a huge amount of experience there. And it's also things like the survey work that goes on um, and how those survey vessels can be utilised for humanitarian and uh, disaster relief, going in and picking people up out of Libya, for example. All of these things. First, first um, vessel into uh, Lebanon, that was a survey vessel um, after the port, when the port was damaged by that, by that huge explosion. Um, but all of those have learning, learning lessons from them, which are then fed back into this machine, which turns them around and goes, right, how do we test and adjust and how do we develop and move forward? And then all of that is fed back into, in, in, into the operational pipeline. So it's a virtuous learning environment and virtuous learning cycle. That's the, that's the intent. That's how they, they try and go forward. Um, does it always work? No, but it is always moving forward and progressing. Andy, I'm, I'm I'm just wondering and reflecting on on that, which is fascinating. And that, yeah, it 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 seems as an outsider looking at uh, the elements and artifacts of uh, military training specifically, there, there's a subtle change going on. In that, you know, you look historically at TNAs, and it would be doctrinally focused. It would be role focused, and of course, you know, training does have to be about getting a certain level of competence within you know, a mission focus, and I, of, of course, that's a given. But but I just wonder whether this, this gentle migration to training to mitigate risks, which we've started to see subtly, is quite significant in the context of this region. You know, when you start bringing in uh, the climate emergency, when we start thinking about, uh, you know, physical protection of infrastructures, you know, across multiple domains. I mean that that is about risk mitigation, isn't it? That that isn't an OTNA designed to meet, you know, a particular set of effects. And I I I just think that 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 may be something that really benefits and excites sort of small island nations and emerging nations, and and it's a partnership that perhaps we could contribute to as equals. Very much so. And, and actually, when you look at when you look at how the Royal Navy does train, and yes, it, it goes to the it goes to war every Thursday. Um, but even in phase one training, when you're looking at um it, it its recruits, when they're doing their practical ex exercises, their leadership and leaderless exercises, it's not war fighting scenarios, yeah. it's disaster relief, it's risk mitigation, it's patrolling, it's maritime security. Um, and, and this is where and you were talking about integration earlier. This is where the Royal Navy really is the, the integrated partner at the right hand of government um, because, because it doesn't just do one thing. Hmm. It does everything. It's constabulary. We don't have a Coast Guard. It is constabulary. It is that um, it, it, it goes abroad and it hosts cocktail parties and it showcases UK defence. It is that broad spectrum. And so every element that the Royal Navy does really feeds into that credibility of, of integration because it, it is the multi-domain. So the first question we got from, uh, from Sean uh, was about, uh, well, it was a fairly broad question about, you know, a whole of government approach, but I was particularly taken by the point about, you know, the Navy and perhaps UK defence offering themselves as a partner for supply chain resilience. I thought I might sort of pitch that to you, John. What do you think the requirement would be at a governmental level for the UK to be, for example, a, a sort of a trusted strategic rear area and, and a sort of a resilience of supplier for, for nations? And where do you think the military might fit? In? I think the the literature now on resilience is is still a contested one. I think that's that's fair. But one of the common points that we're seeing more and more is resilience is 
about response and response includes the private sector and, and it's a, a multi uh, sort of public private uh, set of responses to generate what we would perhaps describe as as resilience i think that plays to my thinking at least very much into the sense of you know what does government or governments have a stake in you know in the future you know where where should they uh, invest as governments you know it, it seems to me that it's no longer about here's a single requirement i've got two billion pound build me x and then i wonder what to do with it later you know i, I think it has to be much more about that relationship derived sense of resilience that we're seeing more and more in the literature and in and in policy making uh, and given that there is a strong protection element to infrastructure through the resilience debate and you know I'm, I'm i'm not an expert on resilience at all but where it plays into kind of what i invest in and what i uh, advise and 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 provide governance to is it's very much you know that the physicality of that investment and, and knowing what to invest in and where and who's got what responsibility so i think it is a it is a government lead i think that we'll see more and more that when we have this debate going forward we'll see that it resides in the kind of responsiveness and the flexibility of industrial mass and competency mass that we have in this country and that could be projected through many ways perhaps yeah, absolutely so we had a question on um the sec the secretary of defense talking about um, you know the submarine versus surface balance and the the likely outcomes of that so i mean in some ways i think that's probably illustrative right on the one hand the capacity to build more submarines does seem to be an open consideration. But on the other hand, if you look at things like augmenting submarines with things like XLUUVs, you know, to increase the mass with an existing manned force, that's an area where on the one hand, you could generate a capability that is easier to produce than a submarine, which adds to your mass, but which more importantly may well fall into the price category amongst other things of nations attempting to erect a sort of a littoral denial zone around their own water. So I, I think one of the outcomes of, of that process might well be the sort of deduction that could be a, a sort of a link between the, the engagement piece and an attempt to generate mass for the Royal Navy itself in the idea that, you know, perhaps manned capabilities uh, might be a bit more difficult to generate than you know the capacity to uh, to augment them um but we have a another question from uh lee willett uh, on uh the forward deployment uh of of frigates in the indo-pacific and uh so and sort of how uh, uh sorry and how that sort of uh, effort uh, sorry not in the indo-pacific but but how that effort towards forward deployment could be enhanced and what more could be sort of got out of it so um do either of you, uh, Andy or Kev, want to take a swing at that? Sorry, I, I will. I'm just trying to start. I'm just trying to find the question. I didn't quite get. Uh... 10.49. For deployment of a second frigate. Yeah. So I so so that um, if I speak to the current plan at the moment, of course, plans are always subject to change. Um, so so the current lay down, um, permanent lay down in in the Indo Pacific mega region, the half half of the world, um, is uh, a couple of um, offshore patrol vessels um, further east, um, some uh, mine countermeasures vessels, and uh, a frigate in in the in the Persian Arabian Gulf, um, and to uh, and to be enhanced, augmented by the end of the decade by um, Type Thirty One in in the east, and um, before then LRG South in probably in the Indian Ocean area. Um, I think what deploying a second frigate would do um, in in the shorter term 
is explore the options available, um, experiment um, to, to see what what that what that future aspiration of a, of a laydown can can do, how it can work, where you can, where you can operate, who you can operate with, um, what is the what what is the right mix, what is the right balance, what is the right um, level of persistent presence. So I I think. Um, I, I think there are opportunities to experiment and explore um, before we get to you know, the, the, the stated aiming point, uh, and maybe that's the, the, the way to go. Right. Well, with that, I see that we are hitting time, so we might draw stumps here. But first of all, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience, both for their attendance and their very insightful questions. Uh, my apologies to anybody whose question I didn't have the time to get to, but you know, please do feel free to email us if you want to pursue the conversation further. Uh, my thanks to both my co-authors, who've been a pleasure to work with, and to Kev Rollins and the RNSSC for their support with this project. Uh, it's, it's been great fun to work on, and I'm, I hope uh, readers get something out of it. And uh, with that, um, I hope everyone has a good rest of the day.